Well, it's been a joy being here. My wife yeah. and I love your pastor and his wife. They're dear friends of ours, and we thank the Lord for the Crane family. Yeah. And I was thinking about one of the greatest accomplishments that your pastor has accomplished. This is a beautiful building, but I'm not talking about the building. I love the building. I love looking around. But I've been around long enough, and those who are young in ministry, you ought to listen, and that is to have four children that end up serving the Lord. What an admirable, and they would recognize it's the grace of the Lord. Uh, but what an example to this church to have four children. We love Johnny, and now that Johnny's pastor, and probably him, and then the three daughters, and of course I know Dan Carr uh, better than all the other sons-in-laws, but uh, the other daughters are great Christians and serving the Lord. Let me turn this just a tab over here. I'd rather hear myself preach than anybody else. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm going to go on temple time tonight. You know, we're eight minutes behind. So if the rapture happens, you'll be eight minutes. <laughs> uh, say a word there. I do have a few of my sermons there. And I went through it actually for a memorial, uh, a memorable year. Uh, in February, I celebrated 40 years of preaching. Uh, also, 45 years of ministry, it started in 1974, and then in just a month ago, uh, I turned the church as far as a senior pastor over to my son-in-law. Uh, after 32 and a half years, and there's been several things going on, and he asked me, my son-in-law asked me to go back and look at some sermons, uh, without looking at all of the sermons, and I've only got like four or five more sets out there, and only $15, and I took I love preaching of principles that we ought to live by. And uh, I selected these four. I'm going to have four more after this. I brought this. Uh, leaving your first love. That's Revelation. And I think the angle of that is not necessarily bad about that. After you've been married for a long time, well, you've left honeymoon love, have you not? And you enter into a deeper love. And so leaving your first love. And then a church without Christ. I'll mention this. Uh, in the sermon, a bit about exhortation from your pastor. And I love the truth here that my children may see the good of thy chosen. That's the book of Psalms. And how that we need to see, and God's blessed me with many, 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 many preachers in my ministry. And that happens, I think, when you see good about people, not necessarily they're bad. And then last of all, and enjoy it. I think we worked that one little sermon right there that's mentioned in Joshua. To Reuben and Gad and have to try the nasty go on the promised land. You ought to enjoy it. And uh, we ought to enjoy our Christian life. Also, uh, Tri State Baptist College uh, is a long, one of the longest running independent Baptist Christian colleges in our country today. My dad established it in January of 1973. And there are many great colleges today, especially Brother Treber, some from Brother Treber. I was just at Commonwealth, and I was at uh, Providence, and uh, other good Christian colleges, but they're usually like 20 years old. Uh, I try to say Baptist College now, Brother Crane is 47 years old. And uh, we're blessed to have many graduates out today. And I'd like for some of you just to consider that, if you would. And we also have, based upon the pastor's recommendation, a one-year tuition-free scholarship. Turn your Bible, if you would, tonight. King James. Amen. Amen. And let's stand, if you would, in Revelation. As I mentioned, we're going through Revelation this year at the church. And I like Revelation. And I like the revealing of, that's what the book of Revelation means, the revealing. And that's Revelation 1. He told John to write the things I was seen, that is a risen Christ, and may I say, we have no future unless our Savior rose from the grave, as he did arise from the grave. Amen. Amen. Chapter 2 and 3, the things which are, that's the church age. We're getting to Revelation 4, we find that the things to come upon this earth as we're taken out. And then notice there in Revelation 19, and notice there in verse number 7, and I will be aware of the time tonight, Revelation 19, and verse number 7. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him. For the marriage of the Lamb is come. And this is what we'll be centering into, and his wife has made herself ready. 
And to her it was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white. For the fine linen is the righteousness of saints. And he said unto me, Right, blessed are they that are called into the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said unto me, These are the true sayings of God. And I fell at his feet to worship. And he said unto me, See thou do it not. I am thy fellow servant and thy brother that have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God. For the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. And your pastor asked you to preach in reference to the church this morning and Sunday school tonight. Of course, it's a, a lot involved. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you now for the preaching of our word. Might we rejoice uh, in this institution that you've given us in our Christian life. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Rarely do we hear sermons in reference to what we call the marriage supper of the Lamb. It involves the brideship of Christ, in which I'm not going to be dogmatic about that tonight. Uh, the brideship of Christ is like point number 10 in our theology. I feel like I've accomplished my job if I can get the average Christian Baptist church to understand the infancy of a church history and our church heritage. Uh, point number one of that would be that Jesus started a church. And that church was started while Jesus Christ was here on the earth. He took the material gathered by John the Baptist, just like Solomon took the material by David, and built Solomon's temple so that our Lord take those who have been saved and baptized by John the Baptist and Jesus, 1 Corinthians 12. And God has said some of the church first apostles, and so we know that Jesus was a pastor, they were the 12 disciples, and then we get to Acts chapter 1. There's 120 in that church will grow mightily. But here's what I want you to know. The true church only started with one church 2,000 years ago. Right. Amen. That church had the Son of God as its founder, Jesus Christ. And that church is point number one, point number two. And that church went into all the world. And that church began to multiply from the little church of Jerusalem. And that church was not known as Baptist. It's not my Baptist name that I trace my lineage. It is that church that began to grow other churches. You ever, you ever read Paul in the epistle? He was pastoring and founding many of those churches there. And those churches had to believe the basic tenets, as I mentioned this morning. Christ is ahead. Salvation is by grace, and I like this, and through Christ only. Yes. And baptism is for believers only. And so those gathering groups uh, came up to the Dark Ages, along came Catholicism and Constantine. And those that were within the Protestant Reformation of Martin Luther and the Lutheran Church and the Presbyterian Church and the, uh, the churches that came out of the Catholic Church, of which we are not Protestants because we did not come out of the Catholic Church. For in 30 AD, Jesus had a church. Later in 313 AD, man started his church uh, under Constantine. And out of that came other man's churches, such as the Lutheran, the Calvin, uh, Lutheran, and other Protestant churches. But the Lord's church has always been in existence since 30 AD, preaching and teaching from this Bible that we have tonight. Yeah. And that is a very simplified form. But here we find something that kind of is a consummation. It's called the marriage supper of the Lamb. I want you to notice concerning the marriage supper of the Lamb that you're to give honor, those your Bible, to Him. Amen. You know, today, if you have a wedding, you give honor to the bride. Here, the honor will be to the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. You know, everything about the church ought to honor Jesus Christ. I look down that aisle and I remember that there's only one way to heaven, and that's Jesus Christ. Amen. I stand behind this book that there'd be no message had not the Lord Jesus Christ come to seek and to save us who are lost. We'd have no message had it not been the Lord Jesus Christ died upon the cross. He is the light of the world. Everything that we have around the church ought to bring honor to Him. For the marriage, notice here, the marriage of the King, no. The marriage of the great carpenter? No. 
The marriage of the great shepherd? No. Moses says the marriage of the lamb. Do you know that everything that we have in Christ starts with Jesus being, as John the Baptist said, behold the Lamb of God who's Amen. coming to take away the sin of the world. Amen. You know, Abraham and Isaac on that mountain, and Isaac asked, I see the wood and I see the fire, but where is the lamb? Yes. And it was that lamb in Revelation 1, in verse number 5, that washed us from our sins in his own blood. And it calls that Jesus died as that lamb, that we have everything that we have as a Christian. And then notice this, and his wife, that's us, have made herself ready. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean, purity, holiness, white. For the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. I would ask your pastor, and I really don't care whether that's practical or imputed righteousness. But I do know this, when we get saved, we get all the righteousness that Jesus Christ had himself. Amen. And the righteousness, but yet I think maybe perhaps even our own righteous deeds. I heard a preacher preach one time recently. Uh, how are you going to look on your wedding day? Are you going to be addressed in the attire of clean and white? And I realize that we have that in the imputed righteousness of Jesus Christ. But his wife has made herself ready in verse number 9. Blessed are they that are called unto the very supper of the Lamb. Indeed, there will be the wife. There will be the bridegroom, and then there everybody has those that are inviting guests to come and enjoy. The first thing that happened to us when we get to heaven will be the judgment seat of Christ. Amen. The judgment seat of Christ will be determined of what sort our works were. I served the Lord for 45 years in ministry today, and that doesn't necessarily mean that I'll have rewards that cause the trying and the fire. We'll test every day to see of what sort it is. God will take my methods, and God will take my motives, and God will take our works that we've done for the Lord, and through the fire that come out, we'll find out whether our motives was right, whether we did it for Him, or we did it for self, and God will take our methods, whether we've done in the spirit and the power of the Lord. Do you know that you can teach a sensor class for many, many years, and if you don't do it for the power and for the honor of God, you know that we would be in stubble one day? Amen. That God will take our judgment seat of Christ. Now, I'm glad to tell you that once Jesus was judged on the cross one time, we're never going to be judged again for our sins. And the judgment seat of Christ, some Christians don't know. They think that God's going to take all of our, our hidden sins and going to reveal it before the whole world. May I tell you, your sins and my sins were judged at the cross of Calvary. Once you receive his blood, you get all the forgiveness of your sins. God's not going to bring back some of our sins, and I was at time on this. And God's going to take our potential that we have in Jesus Christ, and He's going to match it up with what we actually did. A pastor that runs 500 doesn't mean that he's necessarily going to pass the test because God may have equipped him to run 2,000. And a pastor out running at 50 in the church, he's doing all that he can do to do what he ought to do for the Lord Jesus Christ. And many times we're going to find out the first is going to be last, and the last is going to be first. Yeah. And the judgment seat of Christ at the very beginning of the tribute, the very beginning of the tribulations, were called out. And the second one will be this: the marriage supper of the Lamb. I want you to notice in Revelation 19. I want you to notice after the marriage supper of the Lamb. I want you to notice what comes after that in uh, verse number 11. Heaven is open. And that grand parade is going to come from heaven. That heavenly parade in which Jesus will be leading upon a white horse, and we will be his armies. And the great uh, parade that will come from heaven, and Jesus will defeat the armies that are gathered against Jesus Christ at the end of the tribulation. And so we have the marriage supper of the Lamb, and then the Lord says it's time for, to, to saddle your horse. We're going to go down to heaven, or rather down to earth. And we're going to show them who the true King of Kings and the Lord of Lords is after the marriage supper of the Lamb. Amen. Amen. There's to be honor to him. And her wife, or his wife rather, is to make herself ready. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians, For I have espoused you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. 
And the bride was to make herself ready. And the honor was to be given to the Lord. The bride, you could say, was to make herself ready by redemption. And yet even practical righteousness for how are we going to look on that wedding day? Good morning. Good morning. Okay, right here. Yes, we're ready to go now. I'm not going to use this all the time. I'm going to be using this here just a minute. You'll turn. You need to turn on. Yes, sir. All right. That's what I turned it off. There we go. Uh, if you can turn it just a little bit there. I don't have the booming voice of your pastor that I covet. <laughs> uh, back in the Jewish matter of selecting a bride, a young man would leave his father's house as Jesus left his father's house. And that young man would go in pursuit of a bride. And that young man would go and get find a bride that he wanted to marry. When he found that bride, it was not just a matter of saying, will you marry me? There had to be a process, as it was for Joseph and Mary, that they were espoused to be married. And upon that espousal, there would be communication between the father of the groom, the father of the prospective bride. There would be a dowry price that would be paid. Uh, we don't do that in today's society whereby a young man would pay for a wife. Although I'm sure you men would pay a whole lot for the wife that God has given to you. I said you men would pay a whole lot for the wife that God has given to you. A little boy asked his daddy, he said, Daddy, how much does it cost to get married? He said, I will, son. I'm paying him that. We'll see right there. <laughs> and a dowry price would be paid. And the price that was to be paid for our salvation to be the bride of Christ was the blood of Jesus Christ himself. Amen. And that price was agreed upon. And that young man who had left his father's house now would fall in love, he would communicate the price of the bride, and before he'd go, he'd leave a gift to remind her that she belongs to him. And Christ has left to us the Holy Spirit of God, the earnest of our salvation, to remind us one of these days that our bride and groom is coming back for us. And once the, once the marriage was secure and the young man had love and he secured to marry his bride to be, that young man would go home to prepare a place for his bride to come. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God. Believe also in me. In my father's house will be the mansion. Were not so, I would have told you I go to prepare a place for you. And that young man, they, they got the end to work diligently to make sure the place has been prepared for you. And you know you have such a wonderful Lord that all the heavens not going to be all alike because God has specifically designed it just for you. Yeah. And not only would he prepare for the wedding to come by getting the living quarters ready, she was to get herself ready for that wedding day. And back in the Jewish manner, they did not know when that wedding day would come, for it only be in the Father's hands of the bridegroom that would know and would communicate as to the time he would say, Behold, go get your bride. You know, I've lived and I've preached long enough, I've seen these date setters. Yeah. And all of them been wrong. Yeah. Uh, there was a guy back in you know, young guys here. There was a guy back in 1988, Brother Craig, he hit. His name was Wiz Nut, and he had 88 reasons why Jesus come back in 88, 1988. And guess what? 1988 came, and Jesus hadn't come yet. Uh, we're here, here around 2000, all these preachers saying Jesus is going to come back, all these computers are going to crash. In 2000, January 1, 2000, Jesus is going to come back. But guess what? 2001 of January come, came, and Jesus didn't come back. You know why? No man knoweth the hour, neither the day nor hour. Don't you get caught up in some things that are because only, neither, the Bible says Jesus doesn't even know. That's right. Yeah, that's right. Neither the Son, He doesn't know. 
But I can tell you scripturally, man doesn't know the date, but one of these days the Father is going to say to Jesus, go get your prize. Yeah. Amen. And he will go and get us as the people of God. Yeah. And not only after they were married, they would have a supper <clears throat> after they were married. A marriage supper of the Lamb. Because Jesus has gotten his bride clean and white. And the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. And I tell you, it could kind of vary, and I don't argue you the point with but no one we got the imputed righteousness of Jesus Christ. But I'll ask you this if it's personal, practical righteousness, how's your wedding gown going to look on that day? How's it going to look when you've been watching HBO? <coughs> How's it going to look when you don't even come to Sunday night church? And I'm not saying I would be. I don't know. Let God take care of all that. But after they had their wedding supper, he would take them on their honeymoon. You know what our honeymoon is? A 1,000 year of feasting here on this earth. Jesus is going to have a honeymoon with his bride. Amen. 1,000 years. And then you know what's going to happen after a thousand years? He has prepared a place for his bride to dwell. And that is called the Holy City, the New Jerusalem, coming out of God. Prepared as a bride. Amen. And he has prepared that after we are having the supper, after we have the honeymoon, after we have the thousand years here on the earth, Jesus has a place just for us. And I'm going to tell you, and I know your pastor good, this ain't everybody going to live in that New Jerusalem. Eternity would be a new heaven, a new earth, and a new Jerusalem coming down from God above. Yes. Now let me say that with all that as an introduction. Let me say point number one, that we have a glorious church. Yeah. Look at Ephesians, if you would, Ephesians chapter number five. Ephesians chapter number five. We have a glorious church. Ephesians chapter number 5, verse number 25, the same man that a husband loves his wife with a God they love. Verse number 26, that we sanctify and cleanse it. And verse number 27, that he may present it, here we are, he may present it to himself, a glorious church. You know what glorious means? It means a church to be honored. The world today, they don't want to honor the church. But let me tell you, the world, they have, the church has the message the world needs today, and that is of the saving grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. And I think it's about time we honor the Lord's church for what it is, because she is truly a glorious church. Amen. A glorious church. We have been a spouse to our Lord. One of these days, as in the past, Jesus died for the church, Acts 20, 28. Today, Jesus is sanctifying the church. And one day, the church will be married to the Lord Jesus Christ. And it is a church of honor. It is a church that is a glorified church. And then I want you to notice not only a glorious church, but I want you to notice a great church. Turn to the book of Acts. The book of Acts chapter 1. But ye shall receive power. That word of power means doulos is the Greek word. And it's like a dynamite that's released. When the fight like the when you light the uh, the thing there at the end of the dynamite, all of a sudden that energy is released, and the word dynamite, the doulos there is ye shall receive the empowering of what God Himself can do in Acts chapter one and verse number eight. But notice in Acts chapter number four. She's great because she has great power. Acts 4, verse number 33, great power. Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is what, church? The power of God. You know that God gives great power when his message is proclaimed. Great power. I have a message I preach out to uh, other churches when I have time. Maybe you've heard it, Make America Great Again. Amen. You've heard it before, Make America Great Again. <laughs> I have a message called, Make Our Churches Great Again. Yes. 
You know, Trump, one thing you want to do, you want to get the economy going. If we're going to make our churches great again, we've got to get the church economy growing great again. Right. Yeah. And I'm sure all of you brought your tithes and offerings this morning, didn't you? Amen. I said, I'm sure all of you brought your tithes and offerings this morning, didn't you? Amen. 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 Trump, one first thing you want to do is get the economy going again. And i got points that relate to that, uh, that relate to make our churches great again. But our church is great because of the gospel. Paul said the gospel is in the 1 Corinthians 15, how that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures. The gospel is that he died and he was buried and he rose again the third day. Sometimes we bypass the, the burial. But do you know that Jesus was buried according to the manner the Jews was? I know that you didn't train and dominate the ears. You didn't get down on Friday because you can't get three days and three nights on Friday. A good place to amen right there. Amen. <laughs> As God was in the bed of the well three days and three nights. You can't, you can't get three days and three nights in Friday. Right. And the burial is very, very important. And then he died. He was buried. He rose again. But I want you to know this number uh, two about the greatness. There was great grace. Verse number 33. There was great grace. And the grace comes as we stand for that message that God has given to us. I think when it comes to salvation, I don't think we need to give generalities. I think we need to spell it out exactly how a man born again. Romans chapter number 5, you're saved by his life. And by the way, you're not saved by your life. That's right. You're not saved because you commit your life. You're saved because of his life that died on the cross 2,000 years ago. Yeah. And I think there's grace of God. There's the power of God. And I call the third thing in Acts chapter 4, verse number 34 through 37. It says in verse number 37, they went home after the Sunday night service. And they put their house up for sale and their land. And they sold it all and brought it to the church the next day. Anybody willing to do that? You know, faith comes when you put things into action. You can see the Jordan River there, but you don't have faith until you put the sole of your foot in the Jordan River. Your pastor mentioned to me about challenging me back when our church was really growing about having a Pentecost Sunday. We shot for 2,000 and they did not include all our outreach ministries, it wasn't all on property. And I can remember, I think I may still have the letter. You know, Brother Ron, why don't you shoot for a Pentecost? I said, yeah, why don't you shoot for that? <laughs> <laughs> we shot it the first time for 3,000, including outreach ministers and such. And uh, we had 2,500 and some odd, and it was, the, it was more than we've ever had in church, even go back to my dad's day. And then I said, we all ought to be done with that. I said, we're going to shoot for 3,000. We said 3,000, 3,000, 3,000. And we did not have it on that Sunday. Back in 2005, I believe it was, but we did have Brother Frank, but we told you not. We had 2,629, 175 saved, and 46 baptized. Wow. You know why? There's one thing to say you're going to do something, there's another thing to step out and really do it. That's right. I mean, sometimes we've got to take what we believe and step out and do what God called us to do. And then the last thing of greatness I want you to notice in Acts 5, beginning of verse number 1, the story of Ananias. Now these folks acted like they'd given their offering, but they didn't. And there came in verse number 11, great fear. Great fear. And great fear falls upon the church when one disobeys or walks in dishonor to the plan of God and to the program of God. And we don't do what we're supposed to do even against the man of God or against the people of God. I mean, if you're going to church and two people die in front of your eyes, you fear God too, wouldn't you? Amen. I appreciate our PA people. Our very first service into our new building back 22 years ago. I've been fussing with my PA man for some time. He's a good man. I love him. He loved me. And uh, just some things about him on PA set a certain place. I want to set a certain tone, things like that. And he was a good man. He spent a lot of time on our PA. And on Saturday evening, before our new building would be dedicated, open on Sunday morning, about 10 o'clock, 
we were fussing back in the PA room and finally he got upset at me and he said, I'll tell you what, preacher. He said, you see that pulpit up there? You take care of that pulpit and I'll take care of this PA system. <laughs> I, said, I said, Bill, we don't, we don't work like that. <laughs> I walked out. The following Sunday morning at 10 o'clock we had Sunday school. At 11 o'clock we had a brand new building dedicated to God. Had a lot of large ground here. All of a sudden, there was a sound in the PA room. That man hit the floor. Had a brain tumor. Mm. Uh. Had a brain tumor. I buried him. I loved him. And he said, Preacher, do you think I went too far? I said, Bill, I don't care. I don't think you went too far. But I don't know I'm not God. Remember, Fair Boy Missionary Baptist Church, and Daddy, I'm telling you about the story about husband and wife. A husband and wife. That was a music director, and his wife played the piano for all of their life. They were, they were, whatever they were, they were, they were for life. He used to be the PA. He was to be the. Uh, I got PA people. On that. <laughs> uh, he was to be the musician, and she was to be a pianist for life. At Fair Play Missionary Baptist Church back on Dad's day, get that here, Brother Crane's uh, Father's day, and they voted to take the choir and put it up from off the side behind the preacher. The church had voted that. So on Saturday morning or afternoon, the church was up there laboring and halfway, you know, doing the job, taking the choir from over there to back behind the pulpit area. And uh, the man walked in, good man. My dad loved him too. And he walked in and he said, uh, I told you I wasn't for that. He said, I don't think y'all be doing it. My dad generally said, well, you, know, you know, the church voted on that. He said, I don't care. And he got mad. He went to the back door and said, I'll tell you what, I'll never lead another song in this church. Mm. And by the way, my wife will never play the piano at this mm. church again. That was on Saturday evening, mm. 24 hours later. Car accident with an 18 wheeler. Ah. Mm. Took their life just like that. Wow. So God knows how to put a little fear into a church and all the community. Everybody knew what's happening. Yeah. Mm. Mm. Wow. Had a man was committing hormones within our church. I don't usually get down the congregation. That night I got my my microphone and said, "This is not a paper place around here. We're not going to do it like this." Amen. I didn't call his name, but everybody knew I was upset that night because of hormones within the Independent Baptist Church. He met me after church. He's a big guy. He said, "I'm going to break every bone you got in your body." Nope. Little did I know, I didn't know until after that, you know, our church was an ex-professional wrestler. <laughs> he was on my side. He was my side. <laughs> that night, he said, I'm going to break your phone. I have the body. And there wasn't hardly any time that there was an accident. And uh, his mom was killed. Mm-hmm. His sister was left in the hospital mm-hmm. on those tables for three months. Uh, he went through financial disaster. Because you know what? God can put his mom in that church you know, every once in a while we need to learn to don't touch God's anointing. That's right. Amen. Amen. She's a glorious church. She's a great church that God's willing to show his power, God's willing to show his fear. And then I want you to notice a third thing. I'll be close. Look at 1 Thessalonians, I think it is. 1 Thessalonians. And then write the verse, I don't know what it is. 1 Thessalonians. Yes, and we're chapter number two, first Thessalonians two. And Paul is saying, I love you like a mother loves her children. Paul is saying in first Thessalonians two that I love you as a nurse would cherish her children. In first Thessalonians two, in verse number eight, D affectionate desires of you. We were willing to have imparted unto you not the gospel only, but God said, He said, I gave you my soul, I gave you my life. And then I want you to notice He said, because I'm going to say you are greatly loved. I like the word dear. I like words. Uh, ever since I was in the fourth, fifth grade, the teacher told me to get a dictionary out and look at the words. And ever since that, I've always loved words dear. I like dear. The word dear there means you're precious. You're greatly loved. <laughs> and you know, a pastor can be with you as long as your pastor's been with you. Uh, you're dear to him. 
I mentioned I went, became a co-pastor after being pastor for 32 years, and I love our people. My wife loves our people. Your pastor loves you, and your pastor's wife loves you because you're greatly loved. I was trying to instruct our church about a new pastor coming in that applied to this church or any church, and I certainly can say it after all these many years. And I told our church that, number one, y'all respect your pastor for his work's sake. Yes. Do you know your pastor hold a higher office than President Trump holds? That's right. Amen. Your pastor holds the office of a pastor and a shepherd in a local church. Not only should we respect our pastor, but we ought to reward our pastor who's worthy of double honor. Yeah, right. uh, you know, my church always been good to me. You know, you can never overpay a man of God. Right. And then not only should we respect the pastor, and I'm closing down here just a little bit. Uh, we ought to reward our pastor, but uh, we ought to be like David's mighty men. That when he was in the thick of the battle, sometimes the pastor gets in the thick of the battle, and I don't know why David said it. He just said, oh, if I just had a drink from the wells of Bethlehem. Mm. And three of his mighty men here, and just a little comment by King David, went into enemy territory and went down to the wells of Bethlehem and got him a bucket of water and brought it to David, just number three, to refresh him. Mm. And could I tell you, every once in a while, your pastor, like I, 32 and a half years, uh, you don't realize sometimes what just a note, a text, a gift card, just to refresh the pastor means. Amen, that's right. There's been many a time that maybe I had a down day as a pastor, and all of a sudden I go out to my little box here with some note that just says, Preacher, I love you. Amen. We all respect our pastor. And I don't think these young kids here, that uh, young men, I should say kids, but these young men in the ministry, how old are <laughs> uh, these young men that are just in ministry, they would have the right to say it like I could say it after 45 years of ministry. But I can say it to you as a reminder. I want to be an encouragement to churches. You, you ought to reward your preacher. Uh, you ought to recognize your preacher. You ought to respect your preacher. And every once in a while, you don't realize what well, drink out of the wells of Bethlehem and need. Let me just close and say just quick the points here, and I'll stop it a little just a tad after 7 o'clock, temple time. <laughs> Some people do not love their church because they've never made their church dear to them. Sometimes people think they can make it in this whole wicked world without a church, but I'm here to tell you, you can't make it through the church, through the world, without a good church. Some people never made their church dear to them. Some people, their only parts of the church are dear to them. And I know what that's all about. We've had a multitask church for all these years. We've had a bus ministry. We've had a jail ministry. We've had a truck ministry. We've had a children's ministry. We've had a school ministry. We've had a college ministry. And some people love the church because of the ministry. But let me tell you, uh, nothing would go on the church without the mother church. All those ministries supported by the mother church. That's who you want to love. I love the bus ministry, but if something happened in this church, you couldn't have a bus ministry. You know what you want to do? You want to still love this church. Amen. Jesus didn't die for the bus ministry, although it's a ministry. I'll tell you who Jesus died for. He died for the bride, the New Testament church. That's who he died for. I see people, they love our church because of our children's ministry. Time out. You all love the church because of the church. Amen. They love it. It's dear to them. And I've seen that. We've had children's ministries and people love our church and all of a sudden something happens within the children's ministry. Uh, we don't have a particular children's ministry and they're finding another church. You know why? Because you all love the church, Brother Craig. You all love the church. Amen. We've had a college now for 47 years. I love the college ministry. I have 31 active pastors right now wow. out from our college. And sometimes it's up and sometimes it's down. I love the college ministry. Mm -hmm. But Jesus didn't die for the college. He died for the New Testament church. Amen. Sometimes the church is not as dear because you find something out. And what you find out is the church has faults. Sometimes the church has faults. Well, let me just make a breaking news announcement to you. 
Bethel Baptist Church, Temple Baptist Church, and all the rest of the churches are not perfect. People, when they come to your church initially, believe it or not, they love me. They think I'm the best thing since sliced bread. Amen. And then they get closer to me and they find out I've got a few more to in there. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know what you ought to do? You ought, you ought to see what's got that. But now God has set the members in the body, every one of them, and it has pleased Him. You know why you're a member of this church? Why it should be? Because it was pleasing to God. But now God has set the members. Every one of them. You know why you're a member of this church? Because God brought you to this church. Amen. You're going to find out just a quick story. My first preacher boy, God gives me over a hundred, over a well hundred preachers in the ministry. My first preacher boy, I love it. He'd sit on the front, he'd sit on the front row and he'd in He People start uh, criticizing me and he'd always say, you shouldn't criticize them. My pastor. I criticized for criticism. <laughs> Some criticism of pastor. And he was a young man named Bobby. The Bobby made a mistake. He got involved with a young underage girl, about seven years in jail. And during those seven years, my wife could tell you, I called Bobby, I encouraged Bobby. And uh, couldn't wait for the time that Bobby could get out of jail. When he got out of jail, we were under property where we are now. And Bobby got involved in a ministry. The ministry we run for many years. But we had various rules in reference to those ministries, and one of the rules he didn't agree with. Mm-hmm. He said, I'm going to leave. Mm-hmm. I said, Bobby, let me talk to you. And I went to my office before I had a chance of talking to him. Ultimately, he didn't show up. I saw him in the grocery store here a couple of years ago. He ran to me, hugged me, said, I love you, Brother Ron. I said, I love you too, Bobby. I just wish you hadn't left. I wish you'd let me counsel with you. And I wrote on a sheet of paper 101 things that make up a church. And you know, if you're not perfect on two or three, that's still an A, isn't it? I wrote down a hundred things that made up our church and like your church here. The preacher, preaching, stability, doctrine, soul winning, outreach, visitation, staff, organization, Sunday school bus, positions on the Bible, doctrines we have, the music, the choir, the guest singers, are you listening, the spirit, the life of our services, the orderliness of the services, the special services, guest preachers, uh, the people, the fellowship, the ministries, the truck stop, the missions, the jails, the tracks, uh, the youth, the children's ministry, the nursery ministry, the uh, guidelines, the school, the standards, the emphasis of the schools, the standards in the college, and the, uh, the rules, the dormitory, the facilities that we have, and the care for the facilities, and then the uh, cleaning of the restrooms, the auditorium, the Sunday morning service, the Sunday night service, the Wednesday night service, the standards that we have, uh, the offices that we have, the personnel that we have, the stability, the testimony, kind of like your church. Uh, the reputation of the community, the history of the church, the dating policies, the uh, baptismal emphasis, the salvations, and the follow-up, and the positions, the ministries, the young men that call the ministry, our yearly program, our deacon and committees, and uh, uh, alien baptism, and close communion ministry to the fall, and ministry to those who messed up, finances, the foundations and finances, treatment of the pastor, treatment of the staff, uh, the unity of the church, the uh, Christian education, the discipline, uh, trust me, there's 101 things, but yet you get that out of shape because of two things. And you lose the dearness to a church like this. You're not being fair. Sorry. You're just like the Bethel Baptist Church. If you're not, you can learn a great truth tonight that we've got 100 things that make up a church, three or four things are not going well, doesn't make it a bad church. I told our people all those years, I was afraid one of these years to commit thy works of the Lord and establish. I thought, uh, I told our people all these, all these years, uh, I preached to 40 years and how many ever sermons that is, I was afraid that something, uh, all preachers have things that they say that just don't come out right. I don't even know that that sort of thing. But <laughs> I mean, they, I, 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 Lord, please help me. Don't say anything, a bad word in the pulpit. 
Listen, Adrian, the preacher can maybe not word it exactly the way that it should be, and you crucify him for a lifetime. Mm -hmm. That's right. It's not fair. No, he's human too. You have an issue of the Sunday school class and the choir. What you want to say, like Peter? Peter said, "If I got a good life, I got something." Praise God, man. Amen. Amen. And last of all, it's not as dear as it used to be. And then also, I say this. It could be that another church is dear to you. Do you know the church that you got saved ought to always have a sweet spot? Amen. In your heart. Yeah. He was not this church. Do you know the man of God that took you as a little conger in the Lord? When's the last time? Even if it's not Brother Crane, when's the last time you wrote him a letter? That man of God will be dear to you. Brother Dan Carr is a good illustration. I can hardly talk to Dan five minutes and he's thanking me for my investment in his life. Brother uh, Chris Dallas, Brother Chris here, did I can't hardly talk to Chris, hardly a bunch of, uh, a day or talk to him once or twice. He's been talking to him. He appreciates the ministry. And Chris, I say, I'm sure. Maybe it's not this church. But have you forgotten about the man of God and the church that all have a sweet spot in your heart? Right. A glorious church, I'm close, I promise. And then they have a great church, a greatly loved church. The invitation is this. I got your points down, but I want you to come to the altar about Number one, I want you to come to the altar and thank God. And I need it. At least you ought to. I want you to thank God that Jesus shed his blood. Yes, so you can have a church. Number two, I want you to thank God that it's through his church that you grew in the Lord. Number three, I want you to remember with a sweet spot the preacher that was vital in your life when you got saved and you grew in the Lord, whether it be Brother Crane or whoever. And then every once in a while, you ought to refresh your pastor. You ought to refresh your pastor's life. You don't know what just to drink from Bethlehem. Let's stop for prayer.